Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to another all-new edition of geek to me Radio. Today we are joined by the chief social media guru for Marcus Theaters, Mr. Brett Hoffman, talking about movies from 2018. We'll then talk with Bex Taylor-Klaus about the series finale of Ultron, working on Dumplin' on Netflix, and more. Stand by. And if you're driving around the St. Louis area, hearing us on 105.3 FM or 1380 AM, thanks very much for tuning in. If you're out there streaming us in the world online, thank you for finding us out there. And of course, if you're hearing us after the fact in the podcast form on Google Play, iTunes, SoundCloud, or Podomatic, we do appreciate your subscribing and listening there each and every week. We are going to go right to the phones. It's been a uh, busy year in movies, uh, quite a, an interesting year. And we're joined now by the Marcus Marketing Maven Brett Hoffman, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, James. Good, good, good. Uh, so it's been, a, uh, I think, a very solid year for movies 2018. I think definitely, uh, in my opinion, better than last year's box office offerings. Uh, there's a lot that we have are still waiting to see in theaters. Uh, we've, I, I still have not had the chance to see the new Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, unfortunately. But we've also got uh, just some fantastic movies that have hit. Do you have any that are really standouts in your mind? Yeah, you know, I just saw Bumblebee, and I really want to tell people, I know people were not impressed with some of the last Transformers films. They have really done a great job reintroducing this franchise to people with the movie Bumblebee. Uh, it's got a great script. It's based in the 80s, so it has a great 80s soundtrack, and Haley Seinfeld is just absolutely phenomenal on screen. So if you're thinking about not giving Transformers another chance, I'd say make sure you go out this holiday season and see Bumblebee. Uh, while Aquaman is going to be the number one movie of the holiday season, I think Bumblebee is a surprise hit, and you can see that with the Rotten Tomato scores. The critics and the audiences that are given a chance are loving it. It's very weird to see a Transformers movie not getting a bad Rotten Tomato score for a change yes. uh, based on the way the other ones have gone. So I, I'm, I'm glad to see that. This was uh, definitely a franchise I wanted to see succeed. So uh, I'm glad that Bumblebee turned around. Plus, I, I, if it's set in the 80s, I think we've talked before, I'm an 80s junkie, so anything 80s is good. And you mentioned Aquaman being the movie of the holiday season. Um, I haven't checked box office scores or anything lately, but uh, I was wondering which would do better for the holiday season, Mary Poppins or Aquaman? Well, this past weekend, Aquaman is predicted to do about $67 million, and Mary Poppins has about 22 this weekend with Bumblebee at 21. A uh, little bit deceiving because the patterns for the Christmas weeks are a little bit abnormal in that a lot of people are out running around, doing shopping, doing some other things right now. And we'll really see the true story of the holidays once we get actually into Christmas because Christmas Day is traditionally one of the biggest movie-going days of the year. Uh, I think you're going to see Aquaman be number one and Poppins be number two. And we'll see how high Bumblebee can climb given the fact that it's getting some resurgence with some good word of mouth. But uh, Mary Poppins will definitely be a good number two. Just see, we'll just have to see how many people come see it in that week between Christmas and New Year's. And of course, movies that have uh, come and gone in the theater this year, we've had some really outstanding ones. Um, I was very impressed, and I think a lot of people share the fact that uh, this last Mission Impossible Fallout was probably the best one of the series. It was just outstanding. Yeah, I agree, too. I had that one on. That was my number one movie of the year, and I did not see that coming when I entered 2018. But it really surprised me, and 
say what you will about Tom Cruise. Some people don't like him, but this guy is just an absolute phenom when it comes to training and really preparing for things. I mean, he did over 100 high-altitude jumps for a certain scene in the movie that's phenomenal. He got his helicopter license for this movie. And then he has a supporting cast around him, which is just phenomenal as well. When you take a lot, Henry Cavill, Vig Rams, Rebecca Ferguson, Simon Pegg, and even Alice Baldwin. This was a really great story. And uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier, just watching him run was exhausting. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> what he had to do for this movie, uh, which is why it was actually my number one movie of the year. And I'm surprised. Uh, one of the things I should mention is that we've got uh, Black Panther, which doesn't seem it seems like it was longer than a year ago, but just was February. Um, that's actually gotten some Oscar buzz, uh, which I'm glad to see. But I think a lot of the comic book movie fans were kind of shocked. Well, I, I definitely think it was on people's at least top five list or top ten list. It was definitely in my top ten list. I really like Black Panther. Uh, I, I think I'd say I might be in the minority to say I actually enjoyed Avengers Infinity War just a little bit more, but that's because I thought they were a little bit more challenged to try to fit a plot line in with all those characters. But definitely the number one movie of the year, Black Panther, certainly didn't surprise anyone. By the fact that it did well, but I think I don't think many people thought it might beat out Avengers Infinity War, so that was definitely a surprise. And talking just a little bit about uh, you know the the award season coming up here uh, for the 2019 Golden Globes, Black Panther is in Best Picture contention with other ones like uh, Black Klansman, Bohemian Rhapsody, If Beale Street Could Talk, and A Star Is Born. Uh, without veering too far off the movie path, what do you have a uh, one that you think is going to walk away with that category for Best Motion Picture Drama at the Golden Globes? <laughs> You know, I think that's going to be very tough. I mean, I would say the movie that I thought uh, did a very good job, and I think people that are in line for some awards is definitely Bradley Cooper, even though this is his first time directing for A Star is Born, and I can very well see that one winning. Um, even though Black Panther was a great movie from a technical standpoint, I think a lot of people enjoyed it. I, I just don't see a Marvel film winning Best Picture, but I could certainly see it up for a few awards and winning – uh, a lot of the technical awards and some of the mixing awards and things like that. And another movie that no one really uh, was kind of, I guess, people were aware of it, but it, it, it surprised most people is A Quiet Place. Yeah, I mean, this is another movie that no one saw coming. I mean, people knew it was around, but right from the instance it was released, it really got some good word of mouth buzz. I don't think anyone saw $188 million domestically at the box office at this one. And what I really liked about this movie is John Krasinski uh, seems to have come a long way from being Jim at the off in the office. Right. And I think we've seen him just become uh, such a good actor, a versatile actor, and now a director. His wife, Emily Blunt, starred in this movie and did just tremendous. Um, I thought this was a great movie in the fact that it was 90 minutes long, and that, would, that meant the story didn't drag, and it left you satisf satisfied and wanting more. And uh, from a person that uh, is job it is to run movie theaters, this was an interesting movie because the audience was so captivated with what was going on on screen that they were afraid to eat. I mean, in some <laughs> of our in-theater dining uh, venues, people were afraid to pick up their forks for fear they would clang on the plate or do something like that and interrupt the <laughs> film. So that was a challenge we'd never have. And I, I actually thought that was funny. And people actually came out and told us that they didn't even feel they could eat their concessions or they could uh, they can munch on their hamburger just because – they didn't want to interrupt anything that was going on in that story. Yeah, it wasn't at the uh, one of the uh, the the dine-in theaters that I was at, but I, I do know at the screening we were at, uh, it was pretty quiet. Uh, we didn't hear a lot of noise coming from the audience, so that's uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to see that extended. It wasn't just us who was like that. And that, that's supposed to get a sequel, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it is. 2020, they're, they're set to come up with another sequel, and James, I think that might be hard because I think part of the allure was this was a different type of movie. Mm -hmm. It was something that might have been done before, but not recently. So the way they incorporated silence into that movie was pretty much the key thing. Now, how are they going to do that with something different? I'm not quite sure, but we'll, we'll see if they can have lightning strike twice in 2020. And I always thought it was weird. I was talking with someone about this a couple of weeks ago with A Quiet Place. It was billed as a horror movie. I didn't see it as that. I saw it was just a suspense kind of a thriller. I never saw it as a horror movie per se. I would say, too, it was a thriller. I didn't think this was that intense. This was not one of those movies that uh, 
a lot of people who didn't like horror could not stomach or go to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm exactly right, but I, exactly on the same page with you there. Just a lot of things popping out and a lot of tense moments out there. And before we go to break, we should mention Ready Player One, which I enjoyed just on all levels for me, but I think it was targeted towards someone like me, my age, my uh, my gender. I think that was kind of targeted towards me, so I get why I enjoyed that, but I'm surprised it did not do better at the box office. You and I both. This one did $137 million, which isn't bad, but Steven Spielberg really directed a gem in this one. It has such a great homage to the 80s. Uh, so if anyone hasn't read the book, they should read the book. The book is tremendous, too, and it, it kind of suffered from what I thought Tron Legacy suffered from in that I loved it. I really loved everything on screen with the visuals, but it just didn't break through to more of a mainstream audience. Uh, but if you haven't seen Ready Player One out there, go out and see it. And if you're a Shining fan or ever seen The Shining, there's a scene <laughs> in it that pays homage to The Shining. You've got to just watch this movie for those sequences where basically they reenact or go into a, a Shining-like set, and it looks just amazing. Yeah, that was that movie was just all sorts of fun. I immediately bought it as soon as it came out on Blu-ray. So it's uh, it's sitting there waiting to be watched. I'm trying to convince my wife to see it. I haven't done so yet, but that maybe that'll be uh, something we do over the Christmas holiday if it snows. We'll stay in and watch Ready Player One. So yeah, I, I would say yeah, go rent this one if you haven't. I think we're both in agreement. So we're going to take our first break. Uh, we're going to come back, and Brett Hoffman and Marcus Theaters and I, we're going to hit uh, what I, we think might be the most anticipated films of 2019 in this next segment coming up. So stand by. We'll get more movie talk right after this. Hey, I'm Dan Fogler, everybody's favorite muggle, and this is Geek to Me Radio. We are back, joined by the marketing genius of Marcus Theaters, Mr. Brett Hoffman, talking all things movies, recapping 2018. Uh, as I was uh, talking, or as I was waiting online here for the uh, next segment to start, Brett, I happened to come across a thing on Twitter that said, uh, it's it's one of the Twitter moments, that says there was nothing but love for 2018's rom-com resurgence. So before we kind of get into 2019, we did have some pretty decent rom-coms in 2018. I loved, loved, loved Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, we also had uh, some other stuff out there, but uh, that that was one that I didn't think I would like as much as I did like it. I love that movie. Crazy Rich Asians, definitely. I mean, people did not expect that movie to be $174 million. Uh, no one expected that out of this this movie that was coming out in August. Warner Brothers really hit a key demo there. And I think we'll see some more of those movies coming out with more diverse backgrounds. So I think that was something that we really saw. And the other thing that I saw, with maybe not really as much as the rom-com, but Ocean's 8 actually did very well with those ladies coming back at $140 million. Yeah. So that's another movie that I think did uh, better than people thought it would and uh, definitely showed us that these movies with more female cast members or diverse cast members are definitely – here to stay and we should see a lot more of them be successful in the future i definitely enjoyed oceans 8 more than i did oceans 12 i will say i will certainly say that i was uh again we we went and saw that over the fourth of july holiday i think in, in the uh, marcus theaters right there in saint charles and uh, my wife and i both really enjoyed oceans 8 so yeah. as we get into the 2019 uh film going forward i know you've got some anticipated ones on your radar what do you think people should be uh, kind of out there looking for for 2019? Well, I think for your audiences, there's a few that I picked out. The first is it comes out in February, right around Valentine's Day. And I've been talking about this a few different times on the show. It's this movie, Alita Battle Angel. This movie is produced by James Cameron and John Lando. They're the same group behind Avatar. It's directed by Robert Rodriguez. And it's the film that James Cameron would have made if he didn't go down the Avatar route about a female cyborg who is, is saved from a trash heap and looking to really find out who she was in the past. Uh, the, what has been screened at trade screenings, uh, the 3D that's been screened in this is absolutely phenomenal. And I know some people out there don't exactly like 3D, but they'll always tell you, I loved Avatar or I love the movie Gravity in 3D. 
this is some of the best 3D I have ever seen. So hmm. I think this is going to be a movie with fantastic visuals. I think it's going to be a movie people actually want to see in 3D. And I think the only thing that might be a tough sell is it's an original story. But I'm really cheering for this one because I think it's got the pedigree. And uh, with James Cameron writing the script, writing the story himself, and Robert Rodriguez directing, I don't see how we can go wrong here. And I think with all the people, I, I constantly hear from, oh, Hollywood doesn't do anything new anymore. Everything's a reboot. Everything's a, you know, a recycled. I, I would think that the original story would be refreshing to people who would want to put their money where their <laughs> mouth is and get out and see this. Yeah, let, let's just hope so, because it's, uh, it's a great film and possibly has a chance for sequels as well. But we know James Cameron is very busy working on the rest of the Avatar series as well. Right. And obviously uh, a big one that I'm looking forward to, and I think everyone's kind of holding their breath anticipation-wise, Avengers Endgame uh, comes out in April. We finally get the sequel to find out what they're going to do. We've lost half of Earth after Thanos snapped his uh, fingers, half of the universe, really. Uh, but a lot of the big names, the big guns of the Marvel Cinematic Universe were wiped out very quickly. Uh, and I know when that trailer dropped, that teaser trailer, just last week, people went nuts uh, so I can only imagine that the box office on this one will meet, if not surpass, uh, Avengers Infinity War. I certainly think it will. If you haven't seen a tra the trailer, you're one of the few in the world who probably hasn't seen it, <laughs> because that trailer absolutely blew up when it was released. And uh, you and I are really looking forward to this one. And I, I really think the only thing it has going against it is that we're all expecting something big. And when I say big, we're expecting something really, really big. And uh, they just have to top what's been obviously a great Marvel run here and a great run for the Avengers films. And can they pull this off? Uh, it's awfully hard to meet these expectations. But if anyone can do it, it's, it's Disney and this crew, I'll tell you that much. And before that, we've obviously got Captain Marvel, which will kind of set the table for this, uh, which is a flashback. You know, that... that also, that trailer that came out, uh, that, I guess, last month now, uh, got quite a bit of buzz. And I think a lot of people are looking forward to that kind of leading into Avengers. So I think uh, with just those two movies alone, plus we've got Star Wars Episode Nine coming out in December, I think on those three movies alone, Disney can just sit back and not make any more movies for the rest of the year. Well, and let's not forget, they're also coming out with basically a live-action Dumbo, yeah. a live-action Aladdin, and a, a new Lion King and Frozen 2. So when you look at all that that, that Disney's going to do, Disney will be the number one uh, studio in terms of performance at the box office next year, and that lineup is, is one of the strongest I've ever seen from a single studio in one year. And another movie, I think this one's due out in May, is the third chapter in the John Wick series. I, I, I will confess, I did not see the first movie because I'm a huge animal person. As soon as I knew the dog died, I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to be able to watch this. So, so I've steered away, of, away from the John Wick movies, but I know they've done really well. Uh, and I guess with the third chapter coming out, uh, is this going to be a trilogy or is it going to go on into a series? Any any uh, word there? Well, right now they said this is, this is the end. Chapter three is the end. It's the end of a trilogy. And boy, when that first movie came out, I don't think any of us expected much from Keanu Reeves and the story, but it was a really great original story that they developed into this three-part series. And uh, people who have seen these know that they are certainly spectacularly violent. And uh, we'll see what goes on in the third one. I, I've joked around that maybe we should do a contest to see what the body count might be in this third <laughs> one, because the second movie was very intense. I think uh, John Wick, probably on his own took down a few hundred people. But uh, this one should be interesting and, and definitely has given uh, Keanu Reeves a resurgence in his career here. And with uh, Star Wars Episode Nine coming out in December, I know that's a year away uh, till this movie comes out, but it was so interesting to me how people uh, were very, very divided by this last two installments in the uh, final trilogy because we had people who... Force Awakens, which I love. People are like, oh, it's so formulaic. It's basically a reboot of A New Hope. It's the same thing, same concept. But then you get to Last Jedi, where they did something completely different, and then people were like, well, this is the best movie ever. And other people are like, this is an awful movie. Uh, it, 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 did, it did disservice to the fans. We didn't need whole scenes of this. We don't understand why this happened. So I think it's going to be very interesting. This will be probably the movie to watch as far as what the fandom, how they react to Episode Nine. Yeah, I would say so, too. The one thing we've got going on with Episode Nine 
is J.J. Abrams is returning to the director's helm. So I'm really excited to watch that because the past two, uh, some of the pa- couple Star Wars films that have been released have had directorial ch- challenges. I mean, Solo wasn't well, rece- well uh, received uh, when it came out this past May. And we know in that one, Ron Howard had to step in about halfway during the movie to complete that one. Right. Uh, I think that right now, D- Disney and Star Wars, uh, they're kind of hitting the bumpy road because people did not like The Last Jedi in terms of the critical response and the fan response. Solo was a movie that surprisingly only did about $200 million. In fact, if you would have told me at the beginning of 2018 that Ant-Man would outgrow Solo, <laughs> I would have said you were nuts, but it certainly did that. So now we see this is this is a chance to really wrap this one up. But I think if anyone can do it, it's going to be J.J. Abrams. He's one of the biggest fanboys out there. He knows his craft, and uh, I'm really rooting for that to close out this this next year, which is obviously we won't see this one for about a, you know, a whole another year yet. And I'm really it, it disappoints me the the toxicity of the certain uh, areas of this fandom because if you're a Star Wars fan, there are good movies, there are bad movies. No one really liked the uh, prequels when they came out, but now people are saying, well, it's better than Last Jedi, and there's such a divisiveness. But the problem is, we had originally hoped to get an Obi Wan solo movie. There was talk that they were doing a Boba Fett solo movie, much in the vein of Solo, but because so many people decided, well, I didn't like Last Jedi, so I'm going to boycott Solo. They canceled those movies. It's like, if you're a Star Wars fan, if you want more movies, you need to go to the box office. You need to spend and see these movies. Otherwise, we're, what's going to happen is exactly what happened with uh, how Solo underperformed. They pulled Obi-Wan and they pulled Boba Fett from their potential lineup. So now, if you're a Star Wars fan, kids, you need to get out and see the movie regardless. You want to see how it ends. You want to see how the story wraps up. And you want to support the franchise even if you're not a fan that's fine you can critique it but don't you know you're cutting off your nose to spite your face and that really bothers me i i would agree with that i think we really want to see this this whole universe and series live on Uh, i'm actually hoping that disney takes some challenges and shows us things that we might not have known uh i like solo i thought it was a good kind of heist film right now as it was, I, truthfully, I really didn't need to learn a lot about Han Solo. I kind of had an image in my mind about who Han Solo was and how he met Chewbacca, and I was okay with that. And I think that's part of the problem is people have built up their own expectations for these characters, and when they see a new movie, it's kind of like it might contradict what you had always thought or you always had in your mind. But the universe is definitely big and vast, and they've got plenty of different stories to tell. So I... Hope this continues on for my son and beyond. Let's just say that much. I would agree. I'm I'm anxious to see more. I, uh, I'm being a movie fan, as I'm sure you are. Obviously, uh, it's one of those things where I can't get enough. So keep giving me more. I'll if I might not like it, but you know what? I'll go see it at least. So yeah, do- I would say so. So let everybody know. Uh, just if you're listening right now, if you want to follow Marcus Theaters, they are on Twitter at. Marcus Theaters. You can also go to the website, which is MarcusTheaters.com. You can right there join their Magical Movie Rewards Club. Uh, you can get your tickets online to see some of these movies we're talking about, like Aquaman and Mary Poppins and Bumblebee. Uh, they've got the locations if you want to find the closest one to you. And, of course, the concessions, the five-star lounge, the real sizzle. Uh, you can look at the menu if you're anything like my wife who takes forever to make a decision on what to eat. Look at the menu before you get there. That way you're boom, you're done. Uh, Marcus Theaters is fantastic. And like I said, I just went and saw um, uh, we went and saw Aquaman again because I went and saw it at a screening. We ended up seeing it at the Ronnie's, and I love, love, love Ronnie's. So I love that you guys have uh, renovated these theaters like De Pair, and, and it's just absolutely takes my breath away every time I get to see a movie in a Marcus theater. So thank you so much, Brett. Well, thank you. We hope to see people out to make some memories of holiday season at our theaters. And just to remind everyone, our very popular $5 Tuesday special will still remain in effect on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. It's only $5 to see a movie. You also get free popcorn when you're there. And we're hoping that this provides a chance for pretty much anyone to come see a movie and experience some movie magic. So if you want tickets for those shows for Christmas Day and New Year's Day, uh, I'd go and get advanced tickets now. They're going really fast. But hoping that that can remain our gift to, to everyone, to you and all your listeners out there and everyone in the St. Louis area. Um, and hopefully we'll see some people at the movies. Fantastic. Brett, thanks so much. I always enjoy having you on to talk movies. We'll do it again uh, after the first of the year. Happy holidays. Happy New Year to you. We'll see you, James. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. There he goes, Brett Hoffman from Marcus Theaters. We're going to come right back talking with Bex Taylor-Klaus all about 
Voltron series finale, working on Dumplin' and more. Stand by. What's up, guys? This is Jeremy Shader, voice of Finn from Adventure Time, or Lance on Voltron, and you're listening to geek to me Radio. We're back. We had our two-part Voltron extravaganza a couple weeks ago. We talked to Jeremy Shada, Kimberly Brooks, and, of course, Andrea Romano in part one of our segment. Uh, Bex Taylor-Klaus wasn't available to join us for the actual thing, but we did get a chance to catch up with her uh, just this past week. We're joined now by Bex Taylor-Klaus. This is the third time you've been on air with us, so thank you very much again for taking time to be on air. Of course. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, having me back. I can speak, I promise. That's <laughs> all right. Uh, I've, yeah, I've, I've watched you, uh, all the things you've been doing. You've had such an incredible year wrapping up Voltron, which we'll get into, uh, the movie Hellfest. Uh, you were also in, uh, Discarnate and also then Dumplin' on Netflix. So, wow, you've had quite a 2018. Yeah, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> hey, what's been your favorite part about the year so far? Has it just been kind of like a whirlwind when you look back on it? It really has. It feels like, how could it possibly be this all happened in one year. Um, not just professionally, but like personally, I've made some incredible strides in my life and in my, you know, self growth, self love, all that. So it's been, I, I've, I've had more growth career and person and person wise um, than I think I've had in my life. It's been really well, cool. Great. Congratulations on all that, especially then. So where, where do you go now for 2019? How do you, how do you top this then? Oh, there's always further to go. You can always <laughs> go 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 farther go more go harder go home right that's right and speaking of 2019 you you're filming blackbird right now and i looked up the cast list and wow you're alongside kate winslet susan sarandon rain wilson sam neal uh i don't want to get you in trouble obviously because i'm sure it's still filming you can't talk too much about it but uh, that's got to be <laughs> a pretty incredible experience being part of that cast it was unparalleled like we actually wrapped up filming recently, um, and uh, right after we finished filming the, the next day, we all gathered in Susan's living room and got matching Blackbird tattoos because we've become family. That's awesome. So did, is it an arm tattoo? Is it, is it on the back, or can you not mention where it is on air? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can mention it. I can mention it anywhere. Um, no, it's, it's on a... Sam, Rain, Anson, uh, our director, and myself all have in the same spot. And then um, Mia, Kate, and Susan got it uh, in on a wrist, another wrist, and a toe. But the rest of us got it on um, basically the end of our bicep, right by the crook of the elbow. Very cool. That's that's uh, it, You've made so many uh, great connections because I know we've had... Uh, before the uh, premiere of Voltron dropped for this last season, we had both Jeremy Shada and Kimberly Brooks on here, and we also had Andrea Romano uh, the Sunday before that. Oh, I love and Andrea. It, oh, my gosh. The story she told about you, she adores you. Just uh, we, We'll go back and revisit that point in a moment. I adore but, her. She's one of my sheroes. But they've, they've all talked about you know the Voltron family. Every single one of them has said what a close-knit uh, connective group you guys are. So you've just got family all over the place. I really do. I've, I've lucked out more than I can even say. I've found family members in nearly every production I've been a part of, and I'm not letting go of them anytime soon. This has got to be bittersweet for you because it's been such an insane and amazing ride as just a viewer watching Voltron from start to finish. And here we are the last yeah. season and I know you tweeted recently that you're holding off on watching the last episode until uh, the last night of 2018. But having been a part of this experience and been immersed in it, and I know Jeremy and Kimberly talked about the emotions coming out of it. What's it like for you looking back on this uh, this project you've been such a, uh, an integral part of now? It's surreal. It's it's a dream come true in, in sort of every sense of, of that term. Uh, I've always wanted to be a cartoon character, and I've always wanted to have my cartoon family and, and I've got both. I'm working on this project for so many years because all these people have really gotten to know me in my various stages. And like, I've gone through so many, I, I have gone through seeming like so many of the characters and come out the other side being just purely me. And it's really cool to have kind of this path and this journey together, something that 
we're never going to forget. And we're always going to have each other, and we're always going to have the show to show for it. Um, also, I love love the content we've created. It's been an absolute honor and privilege to be a part of it. It doesn't really feel over. I uh, I was busy shooting a Netflix show, so I, I I didn't get to make it in time for the rap party. So for me, it's not over. It <laughs> it might be over when we have our our like cast barbecue, but not yet. And I guess what you mentioned earlier with both the uh, professional and personal growth happening has been such a banner year. I can only imagine that it it must be, um, I, I want to say lucky, but also just a great feeling to know that those two go hand in hand so well together, especially for someone in your field where you're reaching these professional heights, but also you've got, like you mentioned, your uh, your Blackbird family and your Voltron family to help guide you both professionally and to help with that personal growth so what an incredible position for you to be in yeah i've got endless support and unconditional love from my biological family and my family's by choice and i gotta ask too about the tweet you put out about holding off on the last episode of voltron until 2018 uh, the last night of 2018 you said you're going to require cuddles and voltron fluffies what exactly is a voltron fluffy for the listeners who are curious we will get bex's answer to that question right after this, so stand by. Hi, this is Kimberly Brooks, the voice of Princess Allura. You're listening to Geek to Me Radio. We are back. Talking with Bex Taylor Klaus, right before we went to break, uh, we asked them about what was a Voltron Fluffy? <laughs> um... Voltron fluffies are mostly the adorable stuffed creatures that I've accumulated over the years from brilliant fans and, and artists who, who loved our characters as much as I have and gifted me with these beautiful plushies and fluffies, um, particularly like little lions, little pigeons, and I call them murder floofs. I know they're fake caterpillars. Caterpillars, but I totally call them murder flutes. <laughs> well, to add that word to Urban Dictionary for sure, that one's going in there. <laughs> Excellent. And well, yeah, as I mentioned, so I, we talked. Oh. Part of the reason I'm holding out is because I started this season with my partner, and um, I'm like, okay, we're in this together. You're going to need to give me so many hugs and cuddles. I'm not going to watch it without you. You're not going to watch it without me. We're watching it at the end of the year. So is that like a New Year's Eve plan? Is it going to be a very chill and quiet New Year's Eve just uh, just watching Voltron? Or are you, do you have like big party plans for New Year's? Are you a partier? I'm not really a partier. I'm, I'm more like, I'm going to be in Atlanta. So family, friends, cousins, uh, Voltron. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a little bit more tame. I don't really drink, so it's going to be fun to watch everybody else do it. That's always that's always the best part of New Year's Eve is people watching. For me, I, I have to agree with you on that. It really is. It's the best. <laughs> and I mentioned earlier too, we did have Andrea on uh, for the we'd have two part Voltron thing, so we had Andrea for the whole hour, and then the second Sunday we had Kimberly and Jeremy. Uh, but Andrea told she oh, tells the best I story. She is a delight. She is. Oh my goodness, she's one of my heroes. Like I grew up watching her content, the things that she's created are my childhood. And she, she can pull things out of the performers that we didn't know was in there. Um, she's very patient, very kind, and just an absolute joy and honor to be able to have worked with her as long as, we, as, long as we did. And she told a great story about how that she'd worked with you on – uh, it, actually, Jeremy mentioned it was one of his favorite episodes, but she mentioned the episode where Pidge finds out, uh, you know, they come to that huge planet thinking that Pidge has found her brother, and it's actually a, a graveyard. Uh, and there's the beak in there, and she Season said, four, Andrea said, two. yeah, yeah, and, she, and Andrea said she worked with you to get, I think, almost two additional hours of ADR, just panting and everything, and she mentioned how the two of you just broke down and sobbed together in the booth, and she was holding you. And it just, I know yeah. it almost brought me to tears, but what an incredible uh, person to uh, have as your director, as your, as your friend. That's amazing. That, that episode in particular would not be what it is without Andrea being there 
and directing me and, and helping me find that. She is, she's an unparalleled talent. I'm so grateful for her. And do, looking back, do you have, because uh, we, we also posed this question to Jeremy and Kimberly, do you have a favorite episode of your entire run now, looking back, uh, either from a professional standpoint or just like, this was the most fun I had doing an episode? Do you have? Is it hard to pick a favorite? It's really hard to pick a favorite, but I'm going to have to go with the age-old season four episode two reunion. It's the one that we were just talking about because of the yeah. memory of those two extra hours and and crying with Andrea and, and having those sounds come out of me and, and that emotion <laughs> bursting out. It was incredible. And she spoke so fondly of you. She said just, just the, the way that she saw you uh, grow and react and uh, develop as a, a voice actor going into this thing. She, she complimented you profusely. Um, so I do want to pass along that she, uh, you, you definitely have a special Aww. place in Andrea's heart as well. <laughs> Oh, I'm melting. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask about Dumplin' too, because this, uh, this is doing very well um, at working with that cast. How was, how was, uh, how was that to, to be part of that project? Netflix is such a, a, a great format, and we're getting all this original content and working with Jennifer Aniston and Dolly yeah. Parton. How was all that on that show? That was so much fun. Oh, my goodness. I, I've, I've never had a, an experience with so many beautiful, wonderful, compassionate, powerful women behind every single piece of it, you know? Or I suppose I did afterwards, but that was the first time I'd had it. And it was intoxicating. Uh, in a lot of Hollywood, sometimes you'll have women fighting against each other and constant competition, but there was none of that. It was all camaraderie and love and, and complete openness and acceptance and those women, again, are very much like family to me, particularly Odea Rush. I've been over to her home for, for Jewish holidays, and her, her family feels like my family now and vice versa. I was just texting her a few hours ago. <laughs> all, all the families, both your personal and professional, you, it's going to make holiday shopping quite expensive in years to come if this keeps up for you. <laughs> it is. It is. I tend to collect family. It's, it's, it's such a so hard having so many wonderful people in my life i can only imagine so uh besides blackbird what else do we have on the horizon for you coming up in 2019 um well i can say that you will be seeing a lot more of me i'm just not at liberty to say exactly what that is yet understood understood we don't want to break any contractual obligations on some existing shows and look for some new ones fantastic and before I let you go, uh, we played a game with uh, all of your fellow Voltron Paladins uh, that we call Celebrity This or That. I basically give you two options. You just tell me which one is your preference. Uh, I'll start with, for the winter drink, do you prefer cocoa or cider? Ooh. Okay, I prefer cocoa, but I'm allergic to it, so I guess I'm going to have to go with cider. <laughs> That's unfortunate, but that makes the choice a little bit easier, I guess. I know! <laughs> <laughs> Is it is it just something in the cocoa, or is it all chocolate products? I'm allergic to cocoa. My, my I weep for you now. Yep. I, I feel so bad. <laughs> I know. I weep for me, too. Note to self, don't get Beck's cocoa for any holiday or birthday celebration. <laughs> just, I'll, I'll keep a mental note. Uh, for the next choice, regular fries or so curly fries? I'm allergic to most sweets. Oh, regular fries or curly fries? Ooh. I like playing with curly fries, but I like eating regular fries. So it could go either way then, depending on your mood, is what you're saying. Exactly. Most things go either way, depending on my mood. <laughs> That's your prerogative. That's fine. How about uh, for vacation, <laughs> mountains or beach? Ooh, mountains. And if we're... Well, like, I love uh, Santa Cruz because you can go from the mountains to the beach in a matter of minutes. That's true. That's a, that's a good location to be then. That way, again, depending on your mood, you don't have to make up your mind until you get there. Exactly. <laughs> How about... Drama or comedy? Well, comedy is just drama turned on its head. So, so, so you'd go with comedy? Um, I think that everything in life should be a, a balance of the two. So dramedy. Dramedy. There we go. And finally, uh, I hope you can't have one without the other. That's very true. That's very true. Uh, you can't have light without the dark. You have to have the comedy and the drama. That is very true. And I'm not sure how much yeah. of a DC Comics fan you are, but. 
if we said Harlequin or Poison Ivy? Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy. That was that was a clear and concise and quick answer. What do you did, are you? Do you think Harley's just like too much everywhere, or is it uh, is it just a draw oh, no, towards? I'm kind of crushed on Poison Ivy. Oh, that, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'm not sure uh, how much we had you for or anything like that, but I don't want to uh, get in too much to your day. So um, it's always a pleasure to have you on, and you're part of our three-time club now. We've had you on three times. Yay! Woo! <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Thank Love you. And happy you New Year to you, and I hope uh, your 2019 you surpasses your 2018. Aye, aye, Captain. Working on it. Perfect. Thanks so much. We'll keep up with you on Twitter and uh, look forward to seeing more from you. Absolutely. We're going to come back and wrap it up right after this. Stand by. Hi, I'm Bex Taylor Klaus from Voltron. I play Pidge, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. We are back. My thanks once again to Brett Hoffman and Marcus Theaters and to Bex Taylor Klaus for being on air. Uh, I want to mention, too, this is your last chance to get out and enjoy the Christmas Traditions Festival in St. Charles. Ho- head to the website, which is discoverstcharles.com. Check out all the fun things there are to see and do. We're going to be doing a live Periscope broadcast from there uh, for those of you who haven't seen it before. So if you're following me on Twitter, which you should be, I hope, at geek to me Radio, we're going to be doing a live Twitter broadcast today in about an hour's time from the streets of St. Charles so you can see how beautiful it is, how they're lit up and festive. Uh, so I want you to make sure you follow me on Periscope as well. It's at geek to me Radio Instagram. At Geek to Me Radio, Facebook.com slash Geek to Me Radio. Follow me there. And we're going to be back next week doing our year in review. We'll look back on some of the uh, more standout moments from 2018 for the show. We'll talk about some things we might be getting into for 2019. So we appreciate your tuning in every week and following us. And I know our sponsors, I want to say once again a huge thank you to Marcus Theaters and of course to the City of St. Charles, the Greater St. Charles Convention and Visitors Bureau, that website, discoverstcharles.com. Looking forward to bringing on our newest sponsor, Justin's Comics, next year for 2019. We'll let you know more about that in the coming weeks as well. So until then, my friends, happy Festivus. Planet Earth, good night. <laughs>